Hello, everyone. I'm Jan Barris, Vice President of the National Committee on US-China Relations. And I'm delighted all of those watching this video and assure you that the next 30 minutes or so will be both interesting and informative. And we hope will whet your appetite for reading the new book, Americans in China, Encounters with the People's Republic. The National Committee is very pleased to have the book's author, Terry Lotz, with us today. And we've asked Helena Kalinda, Program Director for Asia at the Luce Foundation to interview Terry. Uh, and we did so for several reasons. First is their intertwined histories, which you'll hear about in the interview. Second is the longtime involvement of both of them with the National Committee. And third is the fact that even though their involvement means that they are professional friends of both the organization and of many of the staff members. They are also personal friends and that means a lot to us and it makes this an extra special program for us. So Helena and Terry, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Jan. Um, old friends indeed. And it's really um, such a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Helena Colinda. I direct the Asia program at the Henry Luce Foundation and am a proud member of the National Committee. I'm particularly excited to have this conversation with uh, Dr. Terry Lotz about his new book, Americans in China, Encounters with the People's Republic, which was published this year by Oxford University Press. Um, I, I'm pleased because Terry is a longtime colleague and um, a mentor of mine uh, at the Henry Luce Foundation <laughs> before he went on to, to write books. <laughs> um, Terry is a Moynihan Research Fellow at the Maxwell School at Syracuse University and former Vice President of the Henry Luce Foundation. He's a former Director of the National Committee on US-China Relations as well and a current advisor to the committee's public intellectuals program. Um, Terry has served also as board chair of the Harvard Yenjing Institute of the Lingnan Foundation and the Yale China Association, all organizations that have supported exchange with China. He graduated from Harvard College, served with the US Army in Vietnam and holds an MA and PhD from Stanford University. Terry, from our work together at the Luce Foundation, I know of your long interest in American perceptions of China and Chinese perceptions of the United States and how those have changed over time, driven by conflicting narratives, ideologies, stereotypes, propaganda, and expectations. The book highlights the stories of individuals who have, as you say, breathed life into Sino-American relations. Um, but tell us, um, how is it that uh, you started on this project? What inspired the book? Well, thank you so much, Helena and Jan, for, for your very kind introduction. And uh, it's wonderful to be with you and wonderful to do, be doing a program for the National Com Committee. Um, I first went to China, uh, to the mainland in 1978, thanks to the National Committee. And uh, that changed uh, my understanding, my perceptions of China, and I'm still trying to understand what's going on there. <laughs> uh, I haven't been successful yet, but I, I hope this book at least might be a small uh, contribution to our mutual understanding. And as for what inspired the book, years ago I read a, a book that Jonathan Spence, the renowned historian of, of China who was uh, who taught at Yale for so many years, uh, a book that he called Western Advisors to China, uh, to Change China. And he profiled everybody from Matteo Rishi to uh, American generals who fought in China during World War II. And I thought it might be interesting to uh, and, and worthwhile to update that book and to write biographies of people who've been involved with the PRC, uh, this new entity, new China, uh, that was writing its own rules and uh, you know, sort of changing the rules of the game in a, a very basic way. And so that's where it came from. I was, I was so taken with Spence's approach and the idea of emphasizing these individual stories that that's what, that's what got me going. 
Yes, um, thank you. Uh, and yes, people are at the center of it all, aren't they? <laughs> so yes. they make a big difference in um, in relationships. Um, uh, how is the book organized? You mentioned that it, you you have profiles of uh, of various individuals, but uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Right. Well, it's roughly chrono chrono chronological, and uh, it uh, focuses not only on uh, in the first half of the book on the Cold War, but then on the whole issue of uh, what, what happens after normalization of U.S.-China relations and uh, engagement and beyond. <laughs> and it also focuses uh, on specific topics. And unlike Spence, all of whose characters were white men, I wanted to make sure that there were some women and also Chinese Americans uh, whose story I think has been undertold, underrepresented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was the basic idea. Um, how, how did you decide in the end who to include? Well, I wanted to focus not only on these different periods of, of time, but also uh, some of the, of the turning points in the relationship. Uh, for exa example, uh, normalization of the Korean War, the 2008 Olympics, uh, 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 Tian Tiananmen. And uh, I, I, so there, I wanted to make sure that some of these uh, turning points were covered, but also wanted to cover some of the major themes in terms of uh, values and issues. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and I think there are 10 chapters in the book. Uh, That's right. Um, and uh, two of them focus um, on couples. <laughs> um, who So there are uh, a number of uh, more people than chapters. Uh, most of them are focused on individuals, but several focus on two people. Um, so in thinking about this, you've already described it a little bit, but uh, what answers were you hoping to find uh, as you embarked on this project? Well, I wanted to ask uh, some of the questions that Spence had, had uh, posed. Uh, what influence did these people have on, on China and on U.S.-China relations? Uh, how were their lives changed by the experience of these uh, close encounters with China, and what, and then what lessons can we learn from their experiences? These are people uh, who, who didn't live in a, a bubble when they were in China. Uh, some of them were born in China. Some of them are Chinese Americans who were uh, either born there or have relatives there, and uh, so I wanted to see from these very different stories what. What kinds of outcomes were there? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I hope we can get it a little bit more into that as we go through uh, into our conversation. Uh, but in the interest of time, uh, obviously we can't do all, <laughs> all 10 chapters. Uh, and so we've decided to focus on uh, two periods of time, uh, the Cold War and normalization. Um, and people associated with each of those. Um, and again, in the interest of time, I think uh, the Cold War will get a cameo appearance, but there's a very interesting story uh, in your second chapter uh, about people I'd never heard of before. I found it was fascinating. So please tell us, um, tell us about that, Terry. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. This is a story that I knew nothing about until I started writing the book. There were 21 American POWs in Korea during the Korean War. And here is one of them, uh, Clarence Adams. He was an African American from Memphis, Tennessee. And he decided, he was given the option, and he decided to go to the PRC at the end of the Korean War instead of returning to the United States. And he was one of 21 Americans who made this decision. 
It was a very small number, but it was a propaganda victory for the PRC, or as it was called at the time, Red China. Uh, in contrast, there were 14,000 Chinese prisoners of war after the Korean War who went to Taiwan. Only 7,000 went back to China. Most of those who went to Taiwan uh, had fought for the Nationalist Army during the, during the uh, Civil War. And so uh, here is Adam celebrating with a couple of Chinese uh, on his way to uh, on his way to China. And here he is uh, a year or two later. He's on the left, uh, and uh, some of the other POWs are, are with him, including uh, another African-American. Uh, three of the 21 were African-Americans. And uh, Adams had experienced a great deal of segregation and racism in the United States and in the Army and he believed that he would have a better life in China under communism. And uh, the, the, uh, the Chinese on their part were actively recruiting blacks uh, to come to China uh, because they were presenting uh, China as an anti-colonial and anti-racist model for the third world. And so Americans had a great deal of trouble understanding why on earth any American uh, soldier would choose to go to this authoritarian, you know, dictatorial uh, red China. And the explanation that most people came up with was the idea of brainwashing. And here is uh, a book, a study by Edward Hunter, who was a, a journalist who popularized this term, Xi Nao in Chinese, although the Chinese didn't use this term, they used the term thought reform. Um, and uh, if you can't read the fine print, it says, the calculated destruction of men's minds, the first revelation of the terrifying me methods that have put an entire nation under hypnotic control. And so it was the idea that these people uh, had no ability to make any judgment for themselves, when in fact, uh, what the Chinese called thought reform was really a process of um, encouraging people by way of uh, group education and peer pressure to accept uh, the party, the party's uh, new policies. Yes, and it's a, uh, if I can just interrupt for a second here. Uh, I got so curious about Clarence Adams after reading this chapter that I looked up a little bit more about him online. And at one point he said, uh, well, you can't really call it brainwashing because everything they told me was stuff I had already experienced about racism in the United States. So it wasn't anything new, I knew it. <laughs> yes, yeah, good point, right. And Adams was, was fortunate because he was one of the POW, uh, former POWs who uh, was given the opportunity to uh, study at a, a, a Chinese university. He uh, married a, a Chinese woman, and you, you can see uh, you can see them here with their two children and with his mother-in-law. And uh, you know you, you might have expected or you might have thought that, uh, uh, given his uh, situation as a former uh, American soldier, he would not be accepted or welcomed, but uh, he, he did not experience much at all in the way of uh, discrimination or racism in China. Uh, his, he, he decided to leave the PRC in 1966 as the Cultural Revolution was going on, and at the time he was working at the Foreign Languages Press, uh, the press was becoming more and more politicized uh, and he, he uh, realized that uh, civil rights in the United States was improving uh, somewhat at the time. And so he decided to go back to Memphis, where eventually he was successful in operating uh, Chinese restaurants with his wife. Yeah, it's quite an interesting story. Um, so uh, thanks for sharing that. 
I think the next uh, the next chapter that we're going to focus on was uh, uh, the uh, normalization period um, after relations the rela U.S. China relations were formalized, um, and the, we'll we'll be speaking about uh, Jerome and Joan Cohen. Um, like you, Jerry and Joan are people that I've known for a long time and whom I care about a great deal. Um, like you, Jerry was a longtime colleague and mentor. Um, I worked with him in, uh, in uh, the law, in law practice. And uh, we are linked together, all of us, by the fact that Jerry introduced me to you, Terry, <laughs> which led to my job at the Luce Foundation. <laughs> it's so, true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, um, um, I, I'm eternally grateful to you both um, and pleased to be able to talk about uh, Jerry and Joan. They're certainly a dynamic pair, and how you highlight the parallel of their interests in law and in art in relation to values and freedom of expression, I think is, is really nice. So uh, take it away, Terry. All right. Thank you. And, and uh, I am eternally uh, grateful to Jerry for introducing me to you. <laughs> uh, and so it goes, it goes both ways, for sure. Uh, and I had known uh, Jerry and Joan, like you, not as well, but I'd known them for years. And Jerry, of course, has uh, been uh, in, involved with the National C Committee for many, many years. And, uh, but I, I didn't know the details, and I especially didn't know the details of how he had become involved uh, with China and Joan as well in, in the first place. And it was quite a revelation. Uh, to learn that in 1960, Jerry gave up uh, a perfectly good teaching job at the University of California, Berkeley, to accept a Rockefeller uh, Foundation Fellowship uh, to study Chinese law. And at the time, of course, no one had, no Americans or very few Americans had any access to China. And uh, Chinese law didn't really exist as a field in the West. Uh, Jerry could have done uh, other things in the field of law. He uh, had a, 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 an incredibly uh, a successful career up to that point. But as a young man at the age of 30, uh, he, he decided that he wanted to try something entirely new. And it also interests me to learn that Joan was all for it. You know, Joan, <laughs> uh, they had uh, three little boys at the time, and uh, she didn't hesitate to say, yes, this would be, uh, this would be exciting. And so uh, Jerry uh, really was a pioneer in the study of Chinese law. And Joan, who had a background in Western art and art history, uh, became a, a, a specialist and a pioneer in the field of contemporary Chinese art. And they, uh, in the third year, year of their fellowship, they went to Hong Kong. Uh, Jerry interviewed re refugees from the mainland. And on the basis of those interviews, he wrote uh, his first book on the criminal process in the People's Republic of China. They did not make their first trip to uh, mainland China, however, until 1972. And at the end of the trip, uh, Jerry and this small uh, delegation, Joan went back at the time they were living in Japan, and Joan went, uh, had to go back to uh, be with the boys. But Jerry went to Beijing, and they were honored with a, uh, a dinner with uh, uh, Joan Lai, who I think must have met just about every foreigner who ever came to China <laughs> in those days. Uh, and they were able to see the, the mainland for the first time with their own eyes. But the Cultural Revolution was still going on in 1972. And when they asked to meet with Chinese lawyers and artists, uh, no one was available. Art schools were closed, and uh, there was no evidence of any legal education. So I, I, I think this gave them uh, a different perspective to, you know, to see to see the PRC uh, this early on. Uh, they did end up going to Beijing in 1979 after normalization, and they lived in the Peking Hotel, 
for two and a half years. Uh, and Jerry practiced law with Couder Brothers, a corporate law, I should add, where he did not have a, a background previously, but this was the one thing that he could do that the Chinese wanted and needed. And Steve, uh, sorry, Jerry enlisted Steve Arlins, who's now, of course, president of the National Committee, uh, to work with him. Uh, Steve had been Jerry's student at, at, at Harvard Law School when Jerry was teaching there, uh, as well as Owen Nee, who would come in from Hong Kong. And uh, you must have known all of them at that time. Yes, yes. Um, uh, uh, after the Couder brothers, uh, Jerry then uh, joined, let's see, yeah, joined Paul Weiss, a law firm, and that's where I first uh, uh, met him. Uh, I worked as a paralegal and then later as an attorney for Paul Weiss in Beijing, and the first offices were also in the um, Beijing hotel. <laughs> so remember those days very well. Um, and you know, I was as I was reading the book, I was just thinking about the great intellectual curiosity that both Jerry and Joan had and wanting to share things that excited them um, and uh, uh, so their interest in people. Um, in reading your book, um, Jerry said something about his early work interviewing refugees in Hong Kong, you know, that here instead of stacks of newspapers and magazines were real people <laughs> whose lives to me had previously been a fascinating but abstract academic pursuit. Um, and I think that same spirit of working with people um, was, was what drove him um, in many ways. Um, and that when he decided to leave academic work to, to go into law practice, it was because it was another way to engage with people, to learn about Chinese law up close and personal and to do field work <laughs> through the negotiations in which he took part. Right, and absolutely right. And just to add to that, uh, Helena, uh, Jerry and Joan as well uh, were, were both, they were not armchair academics, as you say, uh, but they were also uh, public intellectuals. They were, uh, you know, very much engaged in the, uh, and Jerry in particular, in the debate about normalization of U.S. China relations. Uh, and, and Jerry, of course, has been a very active voice uh, on human, human rights in China for many, many years. Uh, and, but I should mention that here we have a photo of Joan with the Star Group in 1980. And the Star Group was a, a group of avant-garde artists. They were outside of the uh, state-run academy system in China, and they were doing uh, experimentation, uh, you know, with, with art that was not uh, uh, approved by the state, but there was this period of, of intellectual uh, ferment that uh, Joan uh, was very much part of. And when she came back uh, to New York uh, after Beijing, she published uh, this book on new Chinese painting, which really was the first uh, documentation of what these artists had been doing in China. It was a real turning point for uh, modern and contemporary Chinese art. And it, it took time for Western audiences to uh, accept this idea, you know, that the Chinese actually could produce uh, contemporary art. Uh, people had fixed ideas of what Chinese art was all about. And others, uh, curators and museum directors thought it would be derivative. Uh, and so uh, she kept at it and was very successful in uh, not only introducing young Chinese to contemporary Western art, but then uh, bringing their art and bringing them sometimes uh, to uh, the United States and doing tours and exhibitions and, and so forth. So she was a, a, a tremendous uh, pioneer in this regard. And here's, I, I love this photo of Jerry, uh, which is a painting that was done by Kong Bai Ji, a, a, a Chinese painter um, of, of Jerry, yeah. And uh, it's not totally abstract, but it gives you a, a, a sense. You know, this is not 
uh, socialist realism. It's not the, you know, the Soviet school uh, or the, 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 the Maoist school. It's quite different. And Jerry, uh, when he came back, uh, played a leading role in fostering legal education exchange between the U.S. and China, and as I mentioned before, uh, argued constantly and still is arguing on behalf of the uh, lawyer, the rights of lawyers and dissidents in the PRC and other parts of Asia. Uh, so both of them were instrumental in opening up uh, new avenues for understanding China. Yes, uh, they were certainly advocates and intermediaries in an important way. Um, and you get a sense that they were having fun while they were also advancing causes that they cared about. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of generosity in um, uh, uh, training people and cultivating a new generation of, of interest in, in their various fields. Um, and I totally agree that Jerry um, has remained so principled throughout his career, um, speaking up for the rights of those who have been treated unfairly. Um, as he says, he, he wants to be a constructive critic. So if this were dynastic China, I like to think of him as being uh, a well-meaning and principled official that was remonstrating with the emperor. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's wonderful. And I also have to thank you, Terry, because uh, Jerry is at this very moment working on his memoirs. And um, we're very excited about that and look forward to them. But the chapter that you have provided really uh, is a very nice um, overview of his career and the fact that it is um, very much interwoven with uh, Joan's uh, a career is, is a, an added bonus. Um, I'm, I think we may be getting uh, toward the witching hour here on, on time, but uh, just uh, in closing, uh, I'm just wondering who do you hope will read this book and what do you want them to take away from it? Well, I hope it will be of interest to uh, uh, teachers and uh, students, uh, and, and I hope it'll give them some perspective on this relationship. I hope general audiences might have an interest as well, of course. Uh, but I, I guess what I want them to, or I hope that I will, that they will take away, is um, an understanding that there have been huge ups and downs in the U.S.-China relationship in the past. And so the difficulties that we're facing in uh, U.S.-China relations today, uh, we should realize this is not the first time. Uh, you know, the relationship with China has always been complicated. And I think we often make the mistake of uh, seeing or, to, or trying to view China uh, only through one image. And right now that image is authoritarianism. And uh, when the reality is that China is just uh, more complicated than that. I guess another uh, takeaway is a realization that, uh, and there's been a lot of discussion and debate about this, you know, were Americans uh, able to change China or were they wrong to think they could change China? And I think the reality is, uh, of course, we couldn't just walk in and impose uh, America value, American values. Uh, but we could influence the relationship and to the extent that the Chinese did want to change, uh, particularly in fields like uh, corporate law and even law more broadly, uh, as, as well as uh, business and uh, science and certainly educational exchange, there's been huge, uh, a huge influence and huge change. But it's, again, only if China wants the change. And then uh, I'm hoping that in the discussion of these different values, human rights, uh, freedom of the press, uh, uh, freedom of uh, uh, academic uh, exchange and artistic expression, uh, and these, these other big 
uh, topics that uh, we can gain some understanding from looking at these biographies about why it has been difficult to find common ground. But there have, even in the area of human rights, there have been examples of uh, negotiating for, for common ground. One of the people I write about is John Cam, whose uh, foundation, Dwe Hua, literally means dialogue. Uh, so I think he's a good example of how uh, this needs to be a, a two-way a two -way street. Uh, so change in China is uh, unpredictable, but it is inevitable. And uh, you know, any society, when it goes to one extreme, sooner, sooner or later, it's going to come back. And I think this is true for uh, the Cultural Revolution and Deng Xiaoping's reforms that followed. In other words, had it not been for the extremes of the Cultural Revolution, Deng Xiaoping may, may very well not have had the opportunity uh, to uh, launch his reform and opening period. Yes, and he himself uh, had spent time in France, right? So uh, time uh, in France and time on the farm. <laughs> right. <laughs> he was so purged he, on on two occasions. <laughs> but we do need we do need uh, bridges. So. Here it is, folks, and oh, it's backwards on my screen, but I think you can see it. We just gave you a taste, but we would encourage all of you to um, go out and buy this book. Thank you so much, Terry. <laughs> Thank you.